of mezzo-soprano Marilyn Horn and musicologist Philip Gossett. Well, good evening again. We're backstage now, Marilyn and Philip. You're holding hands here, right? <laughs> a yeah. special well, evening. Long history together. <laughs> this really got the blood running. This ensemble, Bianca Fallero. Now, I have not heard of it. I think most viewers and listeners didn't know it existed. This is special. Well, it's one of his great, great pieces. I. Uh, I know a little about it, but Phil knows a lot about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, first we get to it. This must be a special evening for you, as you said on stage, a long time An coming. unbelievable evening for me, and I just, you know, it's going to be even gone in a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that uh, we've talked about this birthday for a long time, and here we are. <laughs> and you've been working an awful long time, the two of you. You, I know, as a singer, and right. Philip as a musicologist. Oh, the chicken and the egg, where did it start, really, the revival? Philip. Well, it started with both, in a real sense. Uh, you know, when I was studying music, uh, I heard uh, Marilyn sing this music, and I thought it was just the most wonderful thing imaginable. At the same time, I was there over in uh, Europe studying scores and thinking, I may never get to hear this music, uh, but always thinking in the back of my mind, maybe sometime we will hear that, and maybe Marilyn will be the person who will sing some of it. <laughs> what got you into it? Because you have a wide repertory, but there was Rossini. Well, I, I really f sort of fell into it mm -hmm. through uh, Richard Bonning and Joan Sutherland asking me to do the great role of Arsace in Semiramide. And that, I had already sung Cenerentola when I was a lot younger, Cinderella, and I had sung The Barber. Mm -hmm. But to do, in fact, I'd already done Italiana by then, mm -hmm. but this great contralto male role that took so much drama and a whole different kind of approach than the, than the feminine parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, suddenly we said, wait a minute, uh, here's something I can do that nobody else can do because the su success was immediate. And you, know, you knew that there was a lot there that went beyond the Barber of Seville. But there was a problem, Philip. Only what we knew in the books. <laughs> Only what you knew in the books, and the books weren't complete. The books, the books insisted that all of these operas written in Naples, for mm -hmm. example, where Rossini wrote ten operas, they were all I indistinguishable one from the other. They were lists of names. Nobody knew that these were works that really had a character. And each of the characters was different. I remember when we talked about about doing an edition of La Donna del Lago, mm -hmm. people looked at this as if we were crazy. Who would want ever to do that opera? Well, many of them were unknown or just dim memories, and yet there was a detective task for you and other musicologists because some of the scores didn't exist. Some had been changed. Some had been cut and pasted, if one might use that term. So Tell had us. deemed lost. Had deemed, deemed lost. lost. Sure. Well, where did you find them? How did you Well, find there's them? a story to every single one of these operas. Just think about the Tancredi that we heard an excerpt from earlier tonight. Uh, uh, Marilyn and I first talked about Tancredi and her home in New Jersey. And she <laughs> said to me, do we have the tragic finale of Tancredi? And I remember saying at the time, no, uh, we don't have it yet. It's considered lost. Nobody knows where it is. And she looked at me and said, well, if you ever find it, just give me a call and we'll do it. <laughs> and a few years later, over the transom in Pesaro, where we work on this music at the Rossini Foundation, we got a letter from a noble family in Brescia saying they had found some music in their collection, and they didn't know what it was, but it said Rossini. So they sent it to us <laughs> to look at. And, and we, there it was. There it was, the tragic the finale tragic of Tom Brady. As these scores came to light, Marilyn, it demanded a special kind of singing. You've mastered it. We hear a number of other singers who have mastered it. But what is a Rossini singer? What has to come out of here? A Rossini singer is one who has, um, first of all, the ability to sing a beautiful line, a bel canto line, a singer who has a very wide range, very high, very low, and everything in between, <laughs> and who can sing all those fast notes. <laughs> you pick on your feet, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but not only who can sing them, but can make them meaningful. Every one of those quick notes has an expressive value, and that's a lesson that Marilyn taught us. Because we heard already in the first part of the concert that the various idioms of Rossini, the light and bubbly, the more serious that really gets you uh, here in the soul, uh, so to speak. But the importance as a musicologist of Rossini, he came after Mozart, before Verdi early part of the 19th century. How really, important? Well, really, the whole 19th century in Italy comes from Rossini. There were many changes, of course, changes in vocal style, uh, changes in dramaturgy, different kinds of pieces were being done. But all of these composers looked to Rossini as the basis for everything that they did. Uh, Bellini, Donizetti, Verdi, 
all of them found models in Rossini that they made then their own. Now, some people look at the music and he composed, what, these 30 operas, mm -hmm. or at the time he was uh, 35, mm -hmm. 37, and they would say, well, he was wonderful, it's melodic, but was he facile? He certainly could compose very quickly when he wanted to, when he had to, but he was also a, co a composer who knew how to take the time he needed to make the effects he wanted. And when you think about operas like William Tell or Bianca e Faliero, these are operas he gave a lot of time to. You studied not only the scores, Marilyn, but you studied the man. And he was known for a man who loved life, wine, women, and song in no particular order. He stopped composing. And a little food in there. And a little food in between. <laughs> If Rossini were here, because you've done your own detective and research work, if you were alive today, what would you like to ask him? What would you really like to know about Rossini, the man? Oh, wow, that's quite <laughs> a composer. question for the composer. <laughs> oh, I think I'd like, to, I'd like to really sit down with him and say, now, show me what you wanted here. Teach me how to do it exactly as you wanted it, because we really have no way of knowing that we sound anything like those singers. Be, you know, there are no records, there are no tapes, there's nothing like that. Because we can only guess. We can only guess. I mean, right. we came out of a period, it was after the Castrati, it was the end of the Castrati. Right. Where he, uh, and Ro Rossini himself said that that was probably the end of great singing. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't at all. <laughs> no, no. So how much guesswork is going into this, Marilyn, in terms of how well, the original sound was performed? Um, a little guesswork, but we've, you know, we've read an awful lot of books about it, and we've, we've seen the examples that Rossini himself wrote, for instance, when we take a piece and must make it even fancier by ornamenting it, we've seen what Rossini himself wrote. The, the question, I think, the biggest question is whether they sang with vibrato mm -hmm. or didn't sing with vibrato, and, and, I, and my guess is they didn't. When we come back to Rossini and uh, this revival, which both of you worked so hard to bring about, do you think he's back to stay? Philip, is he back in the repertory? Oh, I think so. I think that this... Tell sorry. him your good thing. <laughs> Tell him what the thing that you love the most about, about this in Omaha. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I, the number of performances we've had, of course, all over, all over the world is enormous. But, but, but the thing that struck me most extraordinary was uh, that in Omaha, Nebraska, we're going to have the first staged performance in America of Rossini's Ermione. <laughs> Ermione in Omaha, it sounds like the name of an opera. <laughs> <laughs> but it's happening. Well, our listeners in Omaha know what to look forward to, and I'm sure other... Uh, and Armida in Armida? Tulsa. I mean, this is unbelievable for us. <laughs> All really. over the country. There's a real American <laughs> connection. We're going to get into that in just a moment, Marilyn. Don't go away. Philip, thank you very much for being with us. We're looking forward to the second half and for your contributions in this revival. And We'll be right back. This is live from Lincoln Center, now in the intermission of our Rossini Bicentennial Birthday Gala. We'll return to Garrick Utley backstage with Marilyn Horn and our conductor this evening, Roger Norrington, right after this short pause. Live from Lincoln Center is underwritten by General Motors and its Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, Cadillac, GMC truck divisions, and GMAC. General Motors, committed to excellence. Live from Lincoln Center is also made possible by grants from the Robert Wood Johnson Jr. Charitable Trust and the National Endowment for the Arts. We will return to the Rossini Bicentennial Birthday Gala in a few moments. Stay tuned after Live from Lincoln Center for Charlie Rose at 11, just after the Bulldog edition. Tonight, Charlie looks at the Gotti trial, then he talks basketball with New York Knicks superstar Mark Jackson, convicted Wall Street maven Michael Milken is a topic of Charlie's final segment. Before we return to the Rossini Gala, here's a look at this Wednesday's installment of Edge. Elvis on Woody. Ouija on murder. Robert Hughes on why everybody's whining. And American Gladiators. This is Robert Krolowitz. Join me for all this and more on this month's Edge. Wednesday night at 9. Again, we go backstage to our host, Garrick Utley, with Marilyn Horn, 
and conductor Roger Norrington. And we played some musical chairs here backstage at Lincoln Center, and Maestro uh, Norrington has joined us right now. Congratulations, going well? Enjoying it very much, yeah. No problems so far. Not We're all enough. enjoying it very <laughs> much. <laughs> no problems so far. You specialize, as we know, very much in sort of authentic instruments, the original sound of music. Um, how can we tell how close we are tonight to original Rossini sound? Well, of course, we're using uh, modern instruments, but they're not so very different. Uh, we don't really know how they sang. We can only surmise. We can read and we can imagine. We, all I can say is we get as close as we can from these conditions. Well, it sounds well with this wonderful <laughs> ensemble of singers that you have engaged or working with tonight. And I think one thing we all note with Rossini is that um, the singers can uh, embellish or do embellish quite a bit. There's yeah. a sort of musical ad-libbing going on. Is this something that really pleases you because you don't have to be precise the way Verdi or Wagner wrote a score? I have to uh, tell you that sometimes I'm thrilled to just get to a score that I don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's difficult. Mm -hmm. It's really mm -hmm. difficult. And then you start writing these ornaments and then you keep rewriting and rewriting and finally you say, stop! I can't rewrite it again. I've got to learn it. Well, Maestro, <laughs> how do, what's the relationship between singer and conductor? Some composers are more uh, conductors' operas. As Rossini, as singers are conductors. Yes, well, the Rossini opera, the rule is that the singers make it as difficult as possible for the <laughs> conductor, isn't that it? <laughs> of course. <laughs> and we have to follow them. It's great fun. Uh, but really and truly, decoration is not what bel canto is about. It's one of the features of bel canto. I mean, it's, it's, it's nice to have things decorated, but the, the true flexibility is often written out by the composer. So what it, is bel canto? We, yes. about, we, we know this word, but what is it? It's beautiful singing. It's a late 18th century notion of beautiful singing, very flexible, great service to the words. See, see if you agree with me. Absolutely. Great service to the words, a great truth of expression. I think that's the most important thing. The most important thing is not the decoration, it's the truth of your decoration. Well, we had Del Canto in the first part of the, the last century. Then, then what happened to it when Verdi came along and Wagner disappeared? happened to it, I think. Verismo <laughs> happened to it. Re reality, trying to make a sort of real statement. And Carmen this, was the... Yeah. That's it. Initiator, sort of. of all Carmen of that. did it in. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Carmen did it in. Yes. Well, is it hard then to bring it back now? Is it for singers to oh. get singers to take on these roles? I don't think so. I think the singers, first of all, are looking constantly for new challenges, and these pieces came off the shelves, and and my, we all said, "Wow, these are masterpieces!" And I, we, there are lots of singers out there singing this music now. And for a conductor, when you're working with these singers, uh, right, we have a special gala event such as this evening. Does it require more rehearsal time, more practice, because it is such florid music? It takes a lot of rehearsal time, but everything good takes a lot of rehearsal time. You can't just throw it on. The Rossini takes a, a lot because you've got a team, you've got to develop a teamwork, and the orchestra's got, orchestra's got to know exactly what is happening. It seems very, very simple, this music, but you've got to know exactly what you're doing, and then you've got to phrase it. You know, it all goes down, da 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 da. If you do every one of those the same, it doesn't have a shape. No. Then it's exciting. You build now, on those things. This is not standard repertory of like Bianca we just heard. Mm. It's been, I think, mm. produced once in this country. There's no known uh, recording of it in the United States yet. There's a nice pirate out. There's a pirate out. <laughs> well, you can tell us where we get it afterwards. <laughs> but um, does that make it more difficult, or is there a certain advantage because it's fresh? It's not happening. I think it's easier when you don't, when, you, when there isn't a standard way of doing things. You can invent one and you can experiment much more, yes. It's more fun. Do you think it's back in the repertory to stay as a conductor, as a maestro? You mean that piece or all Rossini? All of Rossini. As much no. Rossini as possible should be back in the repertoire. If it can be well sung, well played, and well staged, yes, absolutely. Why? Because just of the sheer because beauty? Because it's, it's wonderfully witty, ironic, and often tragic music of great quality. And it serves the stage. And terribly romantic. It's terribly romantic, but it serves the stage in the most wonderful way. Well, we're going to hear more of it in a few minutes. I know you have to get back to um, get ready for the second part. I'll go part and of the look at some more of those decorations. Okay. <laughs> no more from me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Maestro, for being with us. Marilyn, let's talk again and some more about you as a singer, but more you as the person who was so instrumental in bringing about this revival. When you see what has happened in the popularity, it isn't just you, it isn't Philip, it isn't uh, Maestro Norrington. But it really is Rossini, isn't it's it? It's Rossini, yes. Sure. But it's also these other singers. How did you go around and help persuade these singers to take on these roles? Well, I mean, I, I heard about certain singers. They were brought to me. Uh, So-and-so would say, this is a very interesting singer for this repertoire. Somebody else, so people would audition for me. I, by then, I was having the luxury of 
of having a lot to say with the casting of the operas mm -hmm. that I did. And so I would hear somebody and say, look, I think you should take this tenor, you should take mm -hmm. this soprano, this alto. Now, you were an established uh, singer, and you could go banging on the door of opera companies and say, this should while. be done. It took a while. Okay. It really did. A lot of resistance. Oh, yes, there was resistance. And what did they tell you, the, in the, the general directors? The, the uh, real... Um, you know, everybody was down on Rossini, and, and I must say, even today, we still have a tough battle that um, a, a lot of people still think that Rossini is a second-class citizen, musically. Why do you think? He was just maligned through that last century, and everybody copied him, and they imitated him, and then there were so many parodies of him, and, and, uh, and then it, it went, became so old-fashioned and out of fashion. But is it possible for these other singers that you brought into the Rossini camp, so to speak, is it possible to sing this broader repertory, that is to say Rossini, and still be excellent in Verdi, oh, be excellent in Puccini? Does oh, one course. help the other? I think absolutely. I th How? I think they do. Mm -hmm. I think that I think one should never get in one rut as a singer. I think that, that if you can sing many different styles, it's very good for your voice. I, I don't think that people should make a steady diet of of heavy Strauss operas, I mean like somebody singing 20 performances of Electra or something like that. No, I think whoever sings that should go back to singing a little Rossini once in a while, at least for exercises. <laughs> well, there are all kinds of Rossini arias we're hearing tonight, and let's take a look, a look ahead at what's coming up. We're going to hear a piece from William Tell, right? Well, this is... The uh, Tenor's Nightmare? Yes, The Tenor's <laughs> Nightmare, absolutely. And uh, I'm happy to say that the the young man who's going to sing it is one of my babies. <laughs> and you don't have to sing it, right? <laughs> right. Oh, thank God. Uh, Why is it difficult and well, special? Well, it's got nine high C's in it, for one thing. For starters? I think it's nine. Maybe it's 20. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, that is just daunting. And there are C sharps in this part. And the tessitura is generally very, very high. And you don't put on William Tell unless you have a tenor who can sing it. And then we're going to have the grand finale this evening. Oh, well, that's going to that's so much fun when all of the singers, all of us at once, get on the stage and sing this wonderful bubbly ensemble from the v Voyage to Reims, which is the, the opera that Philip Gossett found. This was mm -hmm. one that really was supposedly lost. Coming back to the, really the ultimate critics, not the ones who write for newspapers or magazines, but the people who pay for the tickets and buy the recordings, uh, more important in many ways than the people who run opera houses. When you're doing a performance, how do you find them reacting to it? What do you feel there in the, in the opera house? I, I, I have never sung a Rossini performance, I, I swear to you, that the audience just wasn't absolutely with us every minute, and the, the success starts almost from the beginning. And they, well, the first time that I ever sang Semiramide, I, I had no idea what Semiramide was. I knew the overture, and I knew the sort of the soprano aria Bel Raggio. And here I had this part called Arsace. I didn't know what it was. And after I finished that long entrance aria of Arsace, I had this unbelievable ovation. <laughs> I was like this. Are they kidding? Was it you or Rossini <laughs> they were applauding? Well, I hope, hopefully a little of both. <laughs> in fact, in order to sing those performances, we had to steal the book from the Los Angeles Public Library. Really? There were no scores of Semiramide anywhere. So you walked out with it under your yes, arm I'm one day. Very ashamedly, I'm saying that, but damn it, I had to get it. There's probably a little fine you have to put in the kitty there at the right. Los Angeles Public Library. I've Potter. done that. Where do we go from here? Where do you go from here? It's a gala evening. He has been reestablished, resurrected, if you will. But what's well, next? Well, we have. This is the year has just started. The birthday mm -hmm. has just begun. And there are Rossini performances everywhere in, the, um, I'm sure, all over the world. The ones that we basically know about, of course, are the United States, Canada, and all over Europe. Mm -hmm. And there is Rossini everywhere. And what's incredible is operas like Tancredi mm -hmm. and Semiramide and probably La Donna del Lago have entered the repertory. They're in. They're going to stay. Let me just uh, finish up with a quick, partly chauvinistic question. America tonight. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Why? Because the Americans really lead the Rossini revival. The fact that we have these two fantastic tenors. These are the two most famous Rossini tenors in Italy also. And we have this unbelievable bass, Sam Raimi. And we, we couldn't do these operas until we got a great bass. Well, it's a great you know? night to be here. Thanks for being with us. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank you. Marilyn Horn. And that's the conversation, a special conversation on a special evening. The intermission is drawing to a close on this gala 200th anniversary celebration of the birth of Gioacchino Rossini. 
And in the next hour and 15 minutes or so, we'll have more. Beginning with what was referred to during that conversation with Marilyn Horn and Garrick Utley of the tenor's nightmare, the aria from William Tell, Asile Hereditaire, which will be sung by one of the two remarkable tenors who are appearing on this program this evening, Chris Merritt. Mr. Merritt, a native of Oklahoma City in Oklahoma, is, as Marilyn Horn said, the favorite Rossini tenor, not only in performances in this country, but also in Italy, along with his colleague, Rockwell Blake. This aria comes from the final act of William Tell, and as the final act begins, Arnold's father has been killed, and the young man declares that he will abandon his service in the Austrian army and his love for an Austrian princess in order to fight with the Swiss to free their leader, William Tell. Chris Merritt entering onto the platform in front of our chorus and conductor Roger Norrington taking his place at the front of the orchestra for the tenor aria Asile Hereditaire from Rossini's William Tell. Ma bene, 
Hey! 
sweep him off. Follow me, says Arnold, as he urges the Swiss to join him in fighting to free their leader, William Tell. Our Arnold, the tenor Chris Merritt, with male voices from the Concert Chorale of New York. In this aria, Asile Hereditaire, from Rossini's William Tell. Roger Norrington conducting the Orchestra of St. Luke's. Chris Merritt has sung William Tell throughout Europe, including at Milan's La Scala and London's Covent Garden. And here's Chris Merritt, recalled by our audience. And as you can see, the members of the Concert Chorale of New York are applauding just as vigorously as are the people who are assembled here in the audience at Avery Fisher Hall in New York City. Next, we'll have what very well may be the most familiar of all the arias composed by Gioacchino Rossini, the Largo al Factotum from the Barber of Seville. Sono qua, 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 sono qua
Thomas Hampson in the Largo al Factotum from Rossini's Barber of Seville. Thomas Hampson was soloist with Kurt Mazur and the New York Philharmonic in our opening live from Lincoln Center telecast this season, a program that marked Kurt Mazur's debut as music director of the New York Philharmonic. Thomas Hampson then sang the second set of old American songs by Aaron Copeland. Obviously, Mr. Hampson had fun with the Largo al Factotum, and so did the audience. Mr. Hampson, a native of Spokane, Washington, who these days is specializing in Figaro at the Met, singing the role in both Rossini's Barber of Seville and Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro. Here now, soprano Deborah Voigt and mezzo-soprano Kathleen Coleman in a duet from Zelmira, Perché mi guardi e piangi.
Deborah Voigt, soprano, and Kathleen Kuhlman, mezzo-soprano, in that duet from Rossini's Selmira. We heard them separately in the first half of the program, singing the two sacred pieces. And of course, remarkably, the accompaniment for that duet consisted of just two instruments, English horn, which was played by Melanie Feld, and harp, played by Deborah Hoffman. Deborah Voigt and Kathleen Kuhlman returning, recalled by the applause of the audience and the chorus. Next, we'll have a scene from Cerentola, Cinderella, one of the most fascinating among all of Rossini's comic heroines. We'll have Frederica von Stada with Maria Fortuna and Mimi Lerner as her stepsisters, tenor Craig Eastup as her prince, and Jan Opelak and Henry Rooney as her father and Dandini. That ensemble from Rossini's Cenerentola.
Sicilia, per chi tremar, per chi tremar, perché a questo sei, a questo sei. Final scene from Rossini's Cenerentola, Cinderella, 
in which Cinderella forgives her father and stepsisters and expresses her joy at her new good fortune. Our Cinderella, Frederica von Stada, a native of Somerville, New Jersey. And along with her, Maria Fortuna, Jan Opelak, and Henry Rooney, with two singers who made their first appearances of the evening. Mezzo-soprano Mimi Lerner, raised in the Bronx, New York, and tenor Craig Estep from Weddington, North Carolina. Frederica von Stada has just completed singing Rosina in Rossini's The Barber of Seville, and here she is recalled for a solo bow. Our conductor, Roger Norrington, with the Orchestra of St. Luke's and the Concert Chorale of New York. Next, we'll have a trio from Rossini's L'Italiana in Algeri, a trio in which Taddeo and Lindoro dupe the lovelorn Mustafa into joining the noble Italian order of the Papatacci, a fictitious society of men who let their women do whatever they please while the Papatacci swear to eat. Yeah. 
che dormir fa fantasi per malvita o che piacere mangiar io di più non ho di più non so bravare mangiar per la vita per piacere mangiar o di più non ho di più non so bravare fa fantasi di mangiar fa fantasi di dormir per la vita dormir per piacere mangiar o di più non so bravare The Papatacci Trio from Rossini's The Italian Girl in Algiers. Tenor Rockwell Blake, baritone Thomas Hampson, and bass baritone Jan Opala. Too bad that Papatacci were a fictitious society. Their propensity to eat, drink, and sleep sounds very good. And here, our trio of artists returning. Jan Opalak, Rockwell Blake, Thomas Hampson. Next, we'll have the first appearance of the evening of Samuel Ramey, who will sing an aria from the Siege of Corinth.
Guara e la Fortuna from Rossini's The Siege of Corinth. Bass Samuel Ramey with the Concert Chorale of New York and the Orchestra of St. Luke's, conducted by Roger Norrington. Samuel Ramey from Colby, Kansas, who currently is singing both Don Basilio in Rossini's The Barber of Seville and King Philip in Verdi's Don Carlo at the Metropolitan Opera House. And next we have the piece de résistance of this evening's entertainment, the grand concerted piece from Rossini's Il Viaggio a Reims. Now, Rossini composed this for the coronation of Charles X in 1825, and he included every important singer in Paris in this grand concerted piece for 14 solo voices. A group of travelers is disappointed to learn there are no horses to take them to the coronation at Reims. Then a countess learns that the king will be in Paris, and they all rejoice that they can celebrate with him there. All 14 of our artists on the stage for this grand concerted piece from Rossini's The Journey to Reims.
The grand concerted piece from Rossini's The Voyage to Rams for 14 solo singers, sung for us by all 14 of our artists participating this evening in this gala concert celebrating the 200th anniversary of the birth of Gioacchino Rossini. Our conductor, Roger Norrington, with the Orchestra of St. Luke's, and the chorus was the Concert Chorale of New York. Our artists are going to the backstage area here at Avery Fisher Hall in New York City, but obviously this audience will call them back once, twice, who knows how many times. The second consecutive Monday evening of remarkable singing and entertaining music here at Avery Fisher Hall and part of our Live from Lincoln Center tradition. Our singers, George Hogan, Henry Rooney, Samuel Ramey, Thomas Hampson, Kathleen Coleman, Mimi Lerner, Maria Fortuna, Deborah Voigt, Frederica von Stada, Marilyn Horn, Chris Merritt, Rockwell Blake, Craig Eastup, and Jan Opelak. And it's bouquet time on the stage of Avery Fisher Hall. Incidentally, those bells that you saw and heard at the start of Mr. Ramey's aria from the Siege of Corinth were crafted especially for this evening's concert. They are, I suppose, officially called Turkish Crescent. Our conductor, Roger Norrington, refers to them as the Jingling Johnny. And Roger Norrington is at the center, along with our 14 vocal artists this evening. The Orchestra of St. Luke's is one of New York's busiest orchestras, and Roger Norrington is its music director. The chorus master of the Concert Chorale of New York is Donald Palumbo. And all concerned are once again being recalled by the audience here at Avery Fisher Hall. Incidentally, throughout the evening, I've been referring to this as the 200th anniversary of the birth of Rossini. If one really wants to get technical, one would have to say that it's the 48th anniversary of Rossini's birth, because as you may have noticed on that banner that is hung at the back of the stage here, Rossini was born on February 29th, 1792. And logic would say that since then, in the 200 years, there should have been 50 anniversaries of that date. However, in century years where the first two numbers are not divisible by four, and in this case, the years 1800 and 1900, the leap day does not occur. So it's 48 anniversaries of February 29th since the birth of Rossini on that date in 1792. And as was remarked during the course of the conversation between Marilyn Horn and Garrick Utley, it is really to Miss Horn that we owe the rediscovery and the reintroduction of Rossini operas into the repertories of the world's opera houses. This has been another in our Live from Lincoln Center presentations. This is Martin Bookspan. Good evening. Live from Lincoln Center was underwritten by General Motors and its almost 800,000 employees in 38 countries. General Motors is committed to excellence in quality products and television programming. Live from Lincoln Center is also made possible by grants from the Robert Wood Johnson Jr. Charitable Trust.
and the National Endowment for the Arts. This is PBS.